Chapter Six of The House of the Seven Gables. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter Six. Mall's Well. After an early tea, the little country girl strayed into the garden. The enclosure had formerly been very extensive, but was now contracted within small compass, and hemmed about, partly by high wooden fences, and partly by the outbuildings of houses that stood on another street. In its centre was a grass plat, surrounding a ruinous little structure, which showed just enough of its original design to indicate that it had once been a summer-house. A hop-vine, springing from last year's root, was beginning to clamber over it, but would be long in covering the roof with its green mantle. Three of the seven gables either fronted or looked sideways, with a dark solemnity of aspect, down into the garden. The black, rich soil had fed itself with the decay of a long period of time, such as fallen leaves, the petals of flowers, and the stalks and seed, vessels of vagrant and lawless plants, more useful after their death than ever while flaunting in the sun, the evil of these departed years would naturally have sprung up again, in such rank weeds, symbolic of the transmitted vices of society, as are always prone to root themselves about human dwellings. Phoebe saw, however, that their growth must have been checked by a degree of careful labour, bestowed daily and systematically on the garden. The white double rosebush had evidently been propped up anew against the house since the commencement of the season and a pear-tree and three damson-trees, which, except a row of currant-bushes, constituted the only varieties of fruit, bore marks of the recent amputation of several superfluous or defective limbs. There were also a few species of antique and hereditary flowers, in no very flourishing condition, but scrupulously weeded, as if some person, either out of love or curiosity, had been anxious to bring them to such perfection as they were capable of attaining. The remainder of the garden presented a well-selected assortment of esculent vegetables, in a praiseworthy state of advancement. Summer squashes, almost in their golden blossom, cucumbers, now evincing a tendency to spread away from the main stock, and ramble far and wide, two or three rows of string beans, and as many more that were about to festoon themselves on poles. Tomatoes, occupying a site so sheltered and sunny that the plants were already gigantic, and promised an early and abundant harvest. Phoebe wondered whose care and toil it could have been that had planted these vegetables, and kept the soil so clean and orderly. Not surely her cousin Hepsibah's, who had no taste nor spirits for the ladylike employment of cultivating flowers, and, with her recluse habits, and tendency to shelter herself within the dismal shadow of the house, would hardly have come forth under the speck of open sky to weed and hoe among the fraternity of beans and squashes. It being her first day of complete estrangement from rural objects, Phoebe found an unexpected charm in this little nook of grass and foliage and aristocratic flowers, and plebeian vegetables. The eye of heaven seemed to look down into it pleasantly, and with a peculiar smile as if glad to perceive that nature, elsewhere overwhelmed, and driven out of the dusky town, had here been able to retain a breathing-place. The spot acquired a somewhat wilder grace, and yet a very gentle one, from the fact that a pair of robins had built their nest in the pear-tree, and were making themselves exceedingly busy and happy in the dark intricacy of its boughs. Bees, too, strange to say, had thought it worth their while to come hither, possibly from the range of hives beside some farmhouse miles away. How many aerial voyages might they have made, in quest of honey, or honey-laden, betwixt dawn and sunset? Yet, late as it now was, there still arose a pleasant hum out of one or two of the squash-blossoms, in the depths of which these bees were plying their golden labour. There was one other object in the garden which nature might fairly claim as her inalienable property in spite of whatever man could do to render it his own. This was a fountain, set round with a rim of old mossy stones, and paved in its bed with what appeared to be a sort of mosaic work of variously coloured pebbles. The play and slight agitation of the water, 
in its upward gush, wrought magically with these variegated pebbles, and made a continually shifting apparition of quaint figures, vanishing too suddenly to be definable. Thence, swelling over the rim of moss-grown stones, the water stole away under the fence, through what we regret to call a gutter rather than a channel. Nor must we forget to mention a hen-coop of very reverend antiquity that stood in the farther corner of the garden, not a great way from the fountain. It now contained only Chanticleer, his two wives, and a solitary chicken. All of them were pure specimens of a breed which had been transmitted down as an heirloom in the Pinchon family, and were said, while in their prime, to have attained almost the size of turkeys, and, on the score of delicate flesh, to be fit for a prince's table. In proof of the authenticity of this legendary renown, Hepzibah could have exhibited the shell of a great egg, which an ostrich need hardly have been ashamed of. Be that as it might, the hens were now scarcely larger than pigeons, and had a queer, rusty, withered aspect, and a gouty kind of movement, and a sleepy and melancholy tone throughout all the variations of their clucking and cackling. It was evident that the race had degenerated, like many a noble race besides, in consequence of too strict a watchfulness to keep it pure. These feathered people had existed too long in their distinct variety, a fact of which the present representatives, judging by their lugubrious deportment, seemed to be aware. They kept themselves alive unquestionably, and laid now and then an egg, and hatched a chicken, not for any pleasure of their own, but that the world might not absolutely lose what had once been so admirable a breed of fowls. The distinguishing mark of the hens was a crest of lamentably scanty growth, in these latter days, but so oddly and wickedly analogous to Hepzibah's turban, that Phoebe, to the poignant distress of her conscience, but inevitably, was led to fancy a general resemblance betwixt these forlorn bipeds and her respectable relative. The girl ran into the house to get some crumbs of bread, cold potatoes, and other such scraps as were suitable to the accommodating appetite of fowls. Returning, she gave a peculiar call, which they seemed to recognize. The chicken crept through the pails of the coop, and ran, with some show of liveliness, to her feet, while Chanticleer and the ladies of his household regarded her with queer sidelong glances, and then croaked one to another as if communicating their sage opinions of her character. So wise, as well as antique, was their aspect, as to give colour to the idea, not merely that they were the descendants of a time-honoured race, but that they had existed, in their individual capacity, ever since the House of the Seven Gables was founded, and were somehow mixed up with its destiny. They were a species of tutelary sprite, or banshee, although winged and feathered differently from most other guardian angels. "'Here, you odd little chicken,' said Phoebe, "'here are some nice crumbs for you.' The chicken hereupon, though almost as venerable in appearance as its mother, possessing, indeed, the whole antiquity of its progenitors in miniature, mustered vivacity enough to flutter upward and alight on Phoebe's shoulder. "'That little fowl pays you a high compliment.' said a voice behind Phoebe. Turning quickly, she was surprised at sight of a young man, who had found access into the garden by a door opening out of another gable than that whence she had emerged. He held a hoe in his hand, and, while Phoebe was gone in quest of the crumbs, had begun to busy himself with drawing up fresh earth about the roots of the tomatoes. "'The chicken really treats you like an old acquaintance,' continued he, in a quiet way, while a smile made his face pleasanter than Phoebe at first fancied it. These venerable personages in the coop, too, seem very affably disposed. You are lucky to be in their good graces so soon. They have known me much longer, though never honour me with any familiarity, though hardly a day passes without my bringing them food. Miss Hepzibah, I suppose, will interweave the fact with her other traditions, and set it down that the fowls know you to be a pinchon. The secret is, said Phoebe, smiling, that I have learned how to talk with hens and chickens. Ah, but these hens, answered the young man, 
These hens of aristocratic lineage would scorn to understand the vulgar language of a barnyard fowl. I prefer to think, and so would Miss Hepzibah, that they recognize the family tone. For you are a Pinchon? My name is Phoebe Pinchon, said the girl, with a manner of some reserve, for she was aware that her new acquaintance could be no other than the daguerreotypist, of whose lawless propensities the old maid had given her a disagreeable idea. I did not know that my cousin Hepzibah's garden was under another person's care. Yes, said Holgrave. I dig, and hoe, and weed, in this black old earth, for the sake of refreshing myself with what little nature and simplicity may be left in it, after men have so long sown and reaped here. I turn up the earth by way of pastime. My sober occupation, so far as I have any, is with a lighter material. In short, I make pictures out of sunshine, and, not to be too much dazzled with my own trade, I have prevailed with Miss Hepzibah to let me lodge in one of these dusky gables. It is like a bandage over one's eyes to come into it. But would you like to see a specimen of my productions? A daguerreotype likeness, do you mean? asked Phoebe with less reserve, for, in spite of her prejudice, her own youthfulness sprang forward to meet his. I don't much like pictures of that sort. They are so hard and stern besides dodging away from the eye and trying to escape altogether. They are conscious of looking very unamiable, I suppose, and therefore hate to be seen. "'If you would permit me,' said the artist, looking at Phoebe, "'I should like to try whether the daguerreotype can bring out disagreeable traits on a perfectly amiable face. But there certainly is truth in what you have said. Most of my likenesses do look unamiable, but the very sufficient reason, I fancy, is because the originals are so. There is a wonderful insight in heaven's broad and simple sunshine. While we give it credit only for depicting the merest surface, it actually brings out the secret character with a truth that no painter would ever venture upon, even could he detect it. There is, at least, no flattery in my humble line of art. Now, here is a likeness which I have taken over and over again and still with no better result. Yet the original wears, to common eyes, a very different expression. It would gratify me to have your judgment on this character. He exhibited a daguerreotype miniature in a Morocco case. Phoebe merely glanced at it and gave it back. I know the face, she replied, for its stern eye has been following me about all day. It is my Puritan ancestor who hangs yonder in the parlor. To be sure, you have found some way of copying the portrait without his black velvet cap and grey beard, and have given him a modern coat and satin cravat instead of his cloak and band. I don't think him improved by your alterations. "'You would have seen other differences had you looked a little longer,' said Holgrave, laughing. He had apparently much struck. "'I can assure you that this is a modern face, and one which you will very probably meet.' Now, the remarkable point is, that the original wears, to the world's eye, and, for aught I know, to his most intimate friends, an exceedingly pleasant countenance, indicative of benevolence, openness of heart, sunny good humour, and other praiseworthy qualities of that cast. The sun, as you see, tells quite another story, and will not be coaxed out of it, after half a dozen patient attempts on my part. Here we have the man— sly, subtle, hard, imperious, and withal cold as ice. Look at that eye. Would you like to be at its mercy? At that mouth? Could it ever smile? And yet, if you could only see the benign smile of the original, it is so much the more unfortunate, as he is a public character of some eminence, and the likeness was intended to be engraved. Well, I don't wish to see it any more observed Phoebe, turning away her eyes. It is certainly very like the old portrait. But my cousin Hepzibah has another picture, a miniature. If the original is still in the world, I think he might defy the sun to make him look stern and hard. "'You will have seen that picture, then,' exclaimed the artist, with an expression of much interest. "'I never did, but have a great curiosity to do so. 
And you judge favourably of the face? There never was a sweeter one, said Phoebe. It is almost too soft and gentle for a man's. Is there nothing wild in the eye? continued Holgrave, so earnestly that it embarrassed Phoebe, as did also the quiet freedom with which he presumed on their so recent acquaintance. Is there nothing dark or sinister anywhere? Could you not conceive the original to have been guilty of a great crime? It is nonsense, said Phoebe a little impatiently, for us to talk about a picture which you have never seen. You mistake it for some other. A crime, indeed. Since you are a friend of my cousin Hepzibah's, you should ask her to show you the picture. It will suit my purpose still better to see the original replied the daguerreotypist coolly. As to his character, we need not discuss its points. They have already been settled by a competent tribunal, or one which called itself competent. But stay! Do not go yet, if you please. I have a proposition to make you. Phoebe was on the point of retreating, but turned back, with some hesitation, for she did not exactly comprehend his manner, although— on better observation, its features seemed rather to be lack of ceremony than any approach to offensive rudeness. There was an odd kind of authority, too, in which he now proceeded to say, rather as if the garden were his own than a place to which he was admitted merely by Hepzibah's courtesy. "'If agreeable to you,' he observed, "'it would give me pleasure to turn over these flowers, and those ancient and respectable fowls, to your care.' Coming fresh from country air and occupations, you will soon feel the need of some such out-of-door employment. My own sphere does not so much lie among flowers. You can trim and tend them, therefore, as you please, and I will ask only the least trifle of a blossom, now and then, in exchange for all the good, honest kitchen vegetables with which I propose to enrich Miss Hepzibah's table. So we will be fellow labourers, somewhat on the community system." Silently, and rather surprised at her own compliance, Phoebe accordingly betook herself to weeding a flower-bed, but busied herself still more with the cogitations respecting this young man, with whom she so unexpectedly found herself on terms approaching to familiarity. She did not altogether like him. His character perplexed the little country girl, as it might a more practised observer for, while the tone of his conversation had generally been playful, the impression left on her mind was that of gravity, and, except as his youth modified it, almost sternness. She rebelled, as it were, against a certain magnetic element in the artist's nature, which he exercised towards her, possibly without being conscious of it. After a little while, the twilight, deepened by the shadows of the fruit-trees and the surrounding buildings, through an obscurity over the garden. "'There,' said Holgrave, "'it is time to give over work. That last stroke of the hoe has cut off a beanstalk. Good night, Miss Phoebe Pinchon. Any bright day, if you will put one of those rosebuds in your hair, and come to my rooms in Central Street, I will seize the purest ray of sunshine, and make a picture of the flower and its wearer.' He retired towards his own solitary gable, but turned his head on reaching the door, and called to Phoebe, with a tone which certainly had laughter in it, yet which seemed to be more than half in earnest. "'Be careful not to drink at Maul's well,' said he. "'Neither drink nor bathe their face in it.' "'Maul's well,' answered Phoebe. "'Is that it with a rim of mossy stones? I have no thought of drinking there. But why not?' Oh, rejoined the daguerreotypist, because, like an old lady's cup of tea, it is water bewitched. He vanished, and Phoebe, lingering a moment, saw a glimmering light, and then the steady beam of a lamp in a chamber of the gable. On returning into Hepzibah's apartment of the house, she found the low-studded parlour so dim and dusky that her eyes could not penetrate the interior. She was indistinctly aware, however, that the gaunt figure of the old gentlewoman was sitting in one of the straight-backed chairs, a little withdrawn from the window, the faint gleam of which showed the blanched paleness of her cheek, turned sideways towards a corner. "'Shall I light a lamp, cousin Hepzibah?' she asked. 
"'Do, if you please, my dear child,' answered Hepzibah. "'But put it on the table in the corner of the passage. My eyes are weak, and I can seldom bear the lamplight on them.' What an instrument is the human voice! How wonderfully responsive to every emotion of the human soul! In Hepzibah's tone, at that moment, there was a certain rich depth and moisture, as if the words— commonplace as they were, had been steeped in the warmth of her heart. Again, while lighting the lamp in the kitchen, Phoebe fancied that her cousin spoke to her. "'In a moment, cousin,' answered the girl, "'these matches just glimmer and go out.' But, instead of a response from Hepzibah, she seemed to hear the murmur of an unknown voice. It was strangely indistinct, however— and less like articulate words than an unshaped sound, such as would be the utterance of feeling and sympathy, rather than of the intellect. So vague was it, that its impression or echo in Phoebe's mind was that of unreality. She concluded that she must have mistaken some other sound for that of the human voice, or else that it was altogether in her fancy. She set the lighted lamp in the passage, and again entered the parlour. Hepzibah's form, though its sable outline mingled with the dusk, was now less imperfectly visible. In the remoter parts of the room, however, its walls being so ill-adapted to reflect light, there was nearly the same obscurity as before. "'Cousin,' said Phoebe, "'did you speak to me just now?' "'No, child,' replied Hepzibah. Fewer words than before, but with the same mysterious music in them. Mellow, melancholy, yet not mournful, the tones seemed to gush up out of the deep well of Hepzibah's heart, all steeped in its profoundest emotion. There was a tremor in it, too, that, as all strong feeling is electric, partly communicated itself to Phoebe. The girl sat silently for a moment, but soon, her senses being very acute, she became conscious of an irregular respiration in an obscure corner of the room. Her physical organization, moreover, being at once delicate and healthy, gave her a perception, operating with almost the effect of a spiritual medium, that somebody was near at hand. "'My dear cousin,' asked she, overcoming an indefinable reluctance, "'is there not some one in the room with us?' "'Phoebe, my dear little girl,' said Hepzibah, after a moment's pause, you were up betimes, and have been busy all day. Pray go to bed, for I am sure you must need rest. I will sit in the parlour a while and collect my thoughts. It has been my custom for more years, child, than you have lived. While thus dismissing her, the maiden lady stepped forward, kissed Phoebe, and pressed her to her heart, which beat against the girl's bosom with a strong, high, and tumultuous swell. How came there to be so much love in this desolate old heart, that it could afford to well over thus abundantly? "'Good-night, cousin,' said Phoebe, strangely affected by Hepzibah's manner. "'If you begin to love me, I am glad.' She retired to her chamber, but did not soon fall asleep, nor then very profoundly. At some uncertain period in the depths of the night, and, as it were, through the thin veil of a dream, she was conscious of a footstep mounting the stairs heavily, but not with force and decision. The voice of Hepzibah, with a hush through it, was going up along with the footsteps, and again, responsive to her cousin's voice, Phoebe heard that strange, vague murmur, which might be likened to an indistinct shadow of human utterance. End of chapter.